One of my very favorite things that we did with our cheap sedans was take a huge road trip. We did it pretty late in the series and we loved it. It was almost like we rediscovered road trips because we added that extra layer of uh, anxiousness, uncertainty that they might not make it. Now, granted, they should make it. They're not that old. When we started looking for these cars, Todd and I went to autotempest.com to find them because, you know, we needed to know our options. And that is our search engine. So thanks to Auto Tempest for being the headline sponsor. For the challenge, we've gotten two cheap sports cars, but they're cars that we haven't spent very much time with. And that was deliberate. That was the entire point. Because as you know, if we had gotten something to our proclivities, I would have gotten a Boxster. It would have said Porsche on it. Todd probably would have gotten an MX-5 Miata. I bought this 2004 BMW Z4 with 113,000 miles on it. I've already almost put 2,000 miles on this car. Here I found this SLK 280 in Florida, 153,000 miles, and it just turned 154,000 today. Look at that. You're watching Everyday Driver. We make a TV show, podcast, and YouTube channels helping you find a car you'll love. This is our second cheap car challenge, and with the help of Auto Tempest, we're doing a year of adventures in $7,500 sports cars. Subscribe so you don't miss a thing. We went from where we're based in the Salt Lake City area to Western Colorado, which actually has some amazing roads that frankly are kind of near nothing. The great thing about a road that's near nothing is that it doesn't get quite as much traffic as all of the roads you've heard about. And generally, they're magnificent. And I grew up in Colorado in Fort Collins, and I admit to you, until recently, I had never been on this road from Gateway to Telluride, and it's one of the best roads we've been on. So you've got to road trip your car, you've got to get out, you've got to put miles on it, you've got to get to know your car. But these cars also needed a few things, and you know, you kind of have to have that in mind when you're buying a cheap car, because I guarantee you the prior owner probably didn't pay much attention to it. As you've seen in our last video, we fixed various things on these cars. I had pretty good tires, but bad shocks. Paul had pretty good shocks, but bad tires. So we fixed those things. We had them up on a lift, we put all new brakes on thanks to our sponsor Power Stop. We checked out the suspension components and the bushings and all of those things to make sure that these cars were going to be, well, mostly reliable. So this particular car is the 06 Mercedes SLK 280 and it needed tires badly. I don't understand why people drive with tires bald. So we just decided, you know what? Let's do everything. Now that we've serviced these two cars, they're just going, they're happy. There's a zillion things that could go wrong with both. The thing I love about this is you don't have to spend a lot on a car you can thoroughly enjoy and then you can actually go and do things with it. You don't have to hide it away or baby it or be concerned about the fact it's just not going to work. And I admit, just like the sedans, I'm finding new experiences that I love. With the sedans, it was learning about the benefits of luxury in a cushy ride, even if it was 15 years ago. With this, what I'm discovering is I like convertibles a lot in the right situation. And this is kind of the perfect situation. It's fall, the colors are amazing, the temperature is perfect, and I'm thrilled to be at a convertible. If this was the way you drove convertibles all the time, I would own one. Of course, now I do own one, so I'm gonna have to seek these moments out. Yeah, look at this canyon land, look at this place. It's amplified by convertibles. It's amplified by these sports cars. And it just makes it better because we didn't pay very much money for them. I love how responsive the engine is to anything you ask of it, because of course it's a glorious three liter straight six from BMW. It is probably the crown jewel of this car. This has about 230 horsepower and about 220 pound feet of torque. It's not a monster in numbers, neither is that Mercedes, but it is so silky and the engine really wants to be revved out. The straight six in this BMW is not the one in the much beloved E46 M3, but this straight six can be found in things like the ZHP of that same era. It is a great inline three liter from BMW. And this gearbox, while not my favorite, is actually still pretty good. And it's so well matched with this engine. It's exciting to work with them together. My favorite thing about this Z4 is the acceleration. Not because it's the fastest thing out there. I mean, the zero to 60 is just under six. It's not super fast. It just has constant shove to it. And it has a growing howl as you ask more and more of it. That's just pleasing. It makes you want to work with it. You add that to this manual gearbox and it's now a relationship you can have with the car. I know that sounds ridiculous, but it does feel like that. The main thing you feel is the fact that there's no information at all from the steering wheel. That's the big uh, advertisement going on here is uh, this is mute, 
while the rest of the car speaks to you. This car weighs 3,000 pounds, and I've been kind of shocked to discover how light it feels all the time. 3,000 pounds is pretty light for a modern car. There's not very many things that are lighter than that. Of course, I'm a little bit obsessed with lightness anyway. This SLK is 228 horsepower, 221 foot-pounds of torque, which doesn't sound like a lot. I'm continually surprised by the SLK. So far, everyone who drives it gets in and says, huh, there's more here than I thought. The best part is it's a manual. Mercedes-Benz manual, it's better than the Z4. It is crisp, it's a linkage, it feels great. The shifts are clean, short, precise. It's also 3,200 pounds, but it drives heavier than the Z4. Mercedes sold a lot of SLKs. And it was fine, it was a small sports car, but I thought, why aren't these things loved by enthusiasts? Well, it's the handling. It was this engineered deadness that Mercedes engineered into the car to make it feel solid and heavy. But then the problem is, it's a hard top convertible. So more weight in the car, just for all the motors and the arms and a, you know the scissor lift, the triple hinge trunk lid. Okay, I get that, and it definitely changes the balance when you put the top back. You turn in, you think, that steering wheel is dead, but then the short wheelbase reminds you that you're in a tiny car. But there is one point in the middle of a curve where it comes to life, just right there. Here we go, going fast. Turn in, and the car comes to life right there, and it won't hang on to it. I want a car that does that all the time, not just at a tiny little point in the corner. It's there in the SLK. It just doesn't last. If you can stand it, if you can, well, if you can wait for it, this car has a little bit of something in there, right there. Little tiny moments. It's nebulous and it's undefined with this SLK. Okay, I'm gonna hang on, I'm gonna hang on, hang on. Yeah! <laughs> When you're on your road trip, inevitably you're going to stop at a gas station. Of course you are. You're going to go inside for your favorite beverage. Being an American, you'll probably get the biggest possible cup you can find. Come out to your small sports car and discover a couple of problems. First off, because it's a manual transmission, you love that, but that means you can't do this because you need your feet. So now you're left with a cup holder. Well, over on this side, that one's just broken. So over here, it kind of works but it wasn't designed for this kind of thinking. So do you really want 24 plus ounces of your favorite sticky beverage there? Probably not. So that means that this idea doesn't work. This is all I have to carry on this trip. I mean, I've got cameras to shoot with. I've got my overnight bag. I've got my personal stuff, computer, lots of drive space. So now I'm dealing with this as all the space I have to work with. How do I do in my small little sports car? Well, this one actually, is surprisingly good. I'm not sure, I'm not sure that Paul's gonna do this well because look, that's a good amount of stuff. I have space left over. I can go somewhere. Done. This is obviously a small car. You're gonna have to plan very well in advance because to get things in, there's procedures. Being a German car, there's procedures. You've gotta decide on the luggage that you've got and how it's gonna go in. Because if you don't get it right, you can't close this lid right here. And this particular lid is very special to the SLK because to put the top down, the top has to fit on top of this. So you've got to make sure that you can get this latch closed. And then once you do, the top can come back. But if you get all of your stuff in and this won't close, well, that's great. You've got more space in your trunk, but now you can't put the top down. So you're really gonna have to decide. And more importantly is, once you do get the top down, you can't get anything out. And you can see exactly where the top goes. This is the only space that you've got to get anything out. Y you could hear the Monday morning argument. Well, if we're gonna get in the trunk, the top has to be up. Well, what if the top's down? You can't get your stuff out, back and forth. You know that happened. And this is where we landed to keep the car small and still have a retractable hardtop. By 2006, German engineers, including Mercedes, realized that Americans like to drink in their car, including water bottles and cans of soda and coffee as well. But little did they know they were gonna run up against the super bladder buster. And Mercedes decided to put the cup holder right in the middle where you can't, okay, the base fits, 
but if the cup is full, you're gonna dump everything. But the other issue is, it's right in front of the air conditioner. So if you're drinking soda, that's great, keeps it cool. But what if you like hot coffee on a cool day and, okay, that's great, heat's coming out of the vent. But I like hot coffee on hot days, which means the air conditioner is on, and so I've gotta have my hot coffee in front of, okay, so you just have to turn the vent off, more procedures, and then you're good. Okay, we've swapped cars. Oh, that clutch is different. I'm in the 04 Z4, this is 3.0. Huh, I'm, I'm marveling at the differences right now. And they're huge, despite these two cars competing against each other. And here they are competing against each other years later. Yeah, they did when they were new, but the question now remains, which one would you have now that they're super cheap? It's interesting, I do feel like I've got a connection to the Z4 in a strange way, because when this car was introduced, I was asked to do the illustrations for the accessory catalog for the Z4. So if you find one of those catalogs, all those sketches are mine. So I feel like I've got a connection to the Z4 in a strange way too. It's funny, the SLK now feels like a GT car, whereas suddenly I've gotten into a true sports car. But there are dynamics of the SLK that I like in comparison to this. This is also an excellent convertible. This is also an excellent way to spend very little money and go enjoy scenery like this. I almost think that these two cars are now better suited for the task at hand being used than new. Because new, there's that preciousness factor and there's that I don't want to put too many miles on it kind of thing that people do. You didn't pay very much for this car, so if you keep reminding yourself of that, and that you're still getting the same experience that you would have when this car was new, that suddenly makes it an even better value and more fun. Both these cars are so similar and so different. You can feel the longer wheelbase. You can feel like you're sat way back. I feel like it's a dart turned 180 degrees. I feel like I'm steering with the feathers in a weird way. All the weight is back here. It's, it's what it feels like. And the nose is very light. It just kind of does this. But what's strange is, despite the fact that BMWs do handle well, there's not a lot of road information. It just, yeah, it's kind of strange. Oh, oh, it's terrible over bumps. And this is the car with a new suspension. The SLK absorbs bumps far better than this car. This whole car just shakes and you can almost feel the entire chassis just rack. Oh yeah, every bump makes you regret buying this car. What I love about this is the fact that Paul got this car, we both kind of thought, huh, that's interesting. Let's, let's hope it's halfway decent. And you know what? It's one of those cars that surprises. Its reputation is poor. And it isn't designed to be a heavy duty sports car by any means, certainly not in this 280 form. Of course, they made the big SLK AMG 55. This is not that at all. Almost exactly the same horsepower and torque as the Z4 that I got, which is kind of amazing how similar they are. Of course, this is a V6, not a straight six. Let's see what it's got. All right, that V6 isn't bad. It's very satisfying coming out of a corner though. You put your foot in it and it just takes off. It's surprisingly eager. The engine isn't as lovely, it really isn't. I mean, it's fine, it's powerful, it feels pretty good. It feels better than a four cylinder would. However, this gearbox is amazing. It's actually, it's like subconsciously, it's what I expected a Mercedes gearbox to feel like. It is very precise, it is very machined, it has something to say about its job. It does its job very well. Leave me alone while I do my job well. Just talking about the gearbox now. Of course the engine, it's fine. It's a solid V6. It's not a great V6. For a car that looks like the low end of the model range, it's still a surprise. You can definitely sense when you drive this SLK that Mercedes was making a convertible for the Mercedes buyer. They weren't making a convertible for buyers in general. They were making one for their target audience. It has things in it 
dynamically that don't really make sense for a car this small. The wheelbase is shorter than the Z4. It's shorter than a Porsche Boxster. This is significantly shorter in length than the Z4, and yet across the board, this Mercedes feels larger. This feels closer to the scale of a Camaro or a Mustang, like the 36, 3,800 pound car in a car that weighs 3,200 and is significantly smaller. Mercedes has designed a Mercedes sedan feel into a small convertible, and that's bizarre. And yet it has a very grounded feel about it. It feels really confident when you drive it. What's hysterical is the fact that this actually has some steering information. Not much, not much at all, but when you compare it to the fact that the BMW Z4 has none, this is like water to a guy in a desert. There's something here, thankfully, and as a result, you're just like, oh my gosh, steering feel. If Mercedes had taken this car and tried to make it light, if they'd embraced what it was and gave it a feel like a light car, how fantastic would this be? I'm surprised at how much fun this car is on a road where it really never belonged. I mean, this was a convertible, let's be honest, mostly built for the Autobahn. This would be fantastic going super high speeds on the Autobahn. Here I am in the American Southwest, driving along looking at canyon walls and carving corners. Not really its natural habitat. One of you out there is saying its natural habitat is rolling slowly through Beverly Hills while I hold a Starbucks. I understand that. I'm just saying that in the world of small convertibles, you don't picture this on this row. And yet, you know what? It's better than you think. I'm telling you right now, it's better than you think. I prefer my Z4, I do, but this is pretty great. Well bought, Paul, well bought. $6,500 for this, I think that's a find, I really do. And the fact that it's a manual transmission Mercedes, when's the last time you saw a manual transmission Mercedes? Just saw one at all, I don't care how old it was. This is an 06, it feels recent. It's got a nasty rattle over there, I think that's the window. Anyway, it's a used car, 150,000 miles, convertible manual Mercedes that honestly is quite a good competitor to that Z4. I have to say, it's much better than I expected. We need to talk about the styling on the SLK because there's so many people that think the SLK of this generation is nasty. But I do see the Formula One, the F1 inspired nose with the wings in the grill and I, I do like that. I think actually this particular generation, the second generation SLK has more personality and more character than any of the rest, than any subsequent generation of the SLK and now it's the SLC. And the problem is there's zero character on the interior. Interior wise, it's a mixed bag in here. You have Mercedes attempt to make it nice, but at the same time, this is Mercedes of the mid 2000s when honestly their buttons and gauges across the board just looked cheap they feel more expensive than they look, and they still feel good, which speaks to the Mercedes underpinnings. It's still, even though it's the smallest, cheapest Mercedes then in 06, it was still a Mercedes Benz, and they still wanted you to have that feeling of quality. The plastics are fine, and it's actually held up pretty well despite the prior owner doing nothing. This one, of course, has been beat down. 154,000 miles on this car right now, and as a result, uh, stuff's pretty worn in here. Everything, honestly, isn't worn out. It's just filthy. Oh, the grime. I want to scratch it off. It's disgusting. The seats are significantly better than the ones in the Z4. I definitely instantly more comfortable in these, in spite of the fact that these also feel quite tired. I'm really surprised by the window switches. I know that's strange to say, but I like the ergonomic solve here of where the window switches are. They didn't have to put a big side console on the door, a big armrest to accommodate window switches. They just thought, you know, we'll put them right here at the connector piece. It's actually pretty cool. The doors on this car feel like the doors of a limousine. They are so heavy and they have such a clang when they land. I know Paul is obsessed with doors. This car is perfect for him. The styling on the Z4 has aged better, even though the SLK still looks good. The Z4, it turns your head a little bit. That flame surfacing that the world wasn't ready for now kind of looks good. But that's what designers are paid to do is look way ahead and introduce and will this car look good past the first buyer. Where the mileage is shown on this car is mostly the paint, which is not in very good shape. Of course, I'm not very good with paint, so that's kind of perfect for me. The interior is a mixed bag. I actually don't like this uh, fake wood panel here on the center console, but at least it mutes it. It came with this strange concave surface that could be a metal trim, it could be wood. It didn't look like it suited the car, but actually, if you look at it now, 
It suits the car very well. The driver's seat is so worn that the left side bolster next to the door is completely compressed. When you sit in this seat, you're actually canted away from the steering wheel on your left side. It has these seat covers in here that were actually put on by the prior owner. I have left them in an attempt to try to boost that seat. I've actually taken off the seat cover and filled it with extra foam in the places where the seat is most compressed to try to improve the situation. It did improve things, but there was kind of nowhere to go but up. So it's not a great job and I'm considering actually spending the money to get the seat fixed. I just hate to put that money into this car. If we do a whole lot more long road trips like this though, my back would thank me. It's funny is I think Todd and I both like elements of each other's car and I do like that this, you feel lower in the Z4, you feel like you're hanging onto the corners better. But then you get in the SLK, you think, where has this car been? Why does nobody talk about the SLK? I think the SLK is a better road trip car. It's quieter, hardtop convertible, even though the suspension is soft through corners, it's great for road tripping. And then you've got a hardtop convertible. The other way to really get to know a car of any kind is to take a road trip. You need to be in it for multiple hours a day, multiple days in a row. You will come away with such a clear understanding of what the car is good at and where it's best. Okay, so here's how the challenge is going so far. Both cars are running strong. They're excellent. The Z4 is terrible over bumps but I think you knew that already. When we do these cheap car challenges, I find in driving both the cars that we buy, how I'd like to combine features to make my favorite cheap used car. In this, even though the steering isn't full of information, it's more than the BMW. I'd like to have this steering feel added to the BMW, please. I would like this gearbox in the BMW, but I will keep the light and agile feel that the Z4 has, and I'll also keep that glorious engine. So many people have asked us about the German reliability thing and should you do it even at high miles and here I am in the SLK with 154,000 miles. It's just been driven. The prior owner told me that they replaced a coil pack and other than that the car ran. So I changed the oil, the tires, put the new power stop brakes on and it's running brilliantly despite the fear of something grenading, something letting go, which could happen. It could. Much to my surprise, this Z4 is convincing me of the merit of a convertible. And like we discovered with the old sedans, you buy a really cheap version of something and you find that it's not quite right, but it has the bones of something wonderful. And it makes you want to buy a more expensive version. But of course, in many cases, you can't afford the more expensive version. On the other end of the spectrum though, what I do love about this is it is so accessible. This at $7,000 is a surprisingly cheap car with an awful lot of performance. And the minute you get it on a really great road like this, as long as it doesn't break, it doesn't matter what it costs. It's, it's irrelevant. We were running with a pack of Ferraris, yes. We were running with a pack of Ferraris earlier. And it was fantastic. And yes, they were faster than us any time they got the chance to cut it loose. But when you're going down roads that are public, that aren't closed, that have cows in the middle of them, that's not terrifying at all. Okay. Yeah, all right. So you gotta be a little careful because, you know, you might go fast with your Ferrari buddies and then there's a cow. Like there, a cow. So obviously, if you have a more expensive car, there are things about it that are nicer than this. There are things about it that are better performance than this, but I don't think there's more fun there. If you connect with the car that you're in, the amount of fun isn't connected to the dollars at all. And the other thing is, the debate between sports cars and convertibles and this isn't a true sports car, it sure feels like it, especially for this money. $6,500? And you get to put the top down and you get to come out here and do this. I am convinced that this is why convertibles exist, to enjoy scenery like this, not just to cruise. But if you back the SLK off to about seven tenths, it's good, it's fun. It reminds you that driving is fun. Being out here on a bicycle in the middle of nowhere with a long beard isn't as fun. I'm much more excited to have road adventures as a result of these cheap cars than I ever was with all the press cars that we get. And I love getting all the press cars. I like reviewing everything that's out there so we can talk about it here on YouTube and on television and on the podcast. However, something about owning a car that you don't feel the least bit precious about, that runs, that you enjoy, whether it's a big boat like the Phaeton or a small light sports car like this, it's just satisfying to be out on a road trip in a car that you can just use. What I hope this does is make you think whatever car you have, I ought to go on a road trip. 
find a squiggly spot on the map. I don't care if it's a full day's drive away from you. Get a little bit of time, find a spot, and just go for a drive to remember why driving is amazing. Remember the places cars can get you to that you can't believe you're seeing. We've got a lot more challenges for both these cars, but for the moment, on the road trip, I think they're fairly equal. I still have my Lotus Elise. I still love it more than any car I've ever owned. And yet, there are times when I'll just take the Z4, or my son will say, hey, can we take the Z instead of the Lotus? Because it's a genuinely fun car to be in. It's not perfect. I, I genuinely don't like the steering in this car, but the gearbox and the engine are so great, and the whole car feels so light and sorted that it's fun anytime I get to drive it. Cheap convertible, and you're at about six tenths, seven tenths, if you back it off, and you're gonna have to remind yourself, back off, just enjoy the SLK. Yeah, you don't have all the power in the world, it's not the most highly strung car ever, but if you back off and you can look at the scenery and now just enjoy like this, that Mercedes build quality, the, the comfort actually kicks in. That's why I chose the SLK. I thought it was sort of the forgotten, almost sports car up against a definite sports car, the Z4, that has its shortcomings. So now they're trading punches, which is kind of cool. It doesn't matter what my car is. Bring the family minivan. I mean, you'll wish you're in something else, but bring the family minivan to a great road and remember why driving is amazing. Do your own $7,500 or less search. Click the Autotempest link in the video description and tell us in the comments what you've come up with.